it's, it's good to see you here at the 11th William C. Moran Address. Uh, the address is given in honour of William C. Moran for his lifelong dedication to education and particularly to his years as Vice President for Academic Affairs at Francis Marion. And uh, we're fortunate today to have some of his family in the audience, uh, his son Tom and his wife Liz and grandchildren Michael and Sarah. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and thank you for the support of this address. Well, today's address is being given by my friend and colleague, Ken Williams. I first met Ken soon after I came to Francis Marion. It was a Friday night, went out to dinner with some friends, and lo and behold, we ended up back at uh, the house of Ken and Ellen uh, that night. Uh, I remember going home and calling my wife because she hadn't come down to Florence yet, and just talking about the welcome that I, I had received coming to Florence for the first time. And Ken and Ellen have been uh, good friends uh, since that time. Ken grew up in Long Island, New York, New York uh, received his bachelor's degree from Gettysburg College. Uh, then in 1975, his master's from the University of Maryland. He spent some time thereafter teaching at uh, Stockton State College, I believe. Uh, but then entered the uh, Virginia Tech and received his PhD in chemistry in 1985 and uh, soon thereafter came to Francis Marion and has been here ever since and uh, this I believe is his final year of teaching at Francis Marion or so he says at the moment but please welcome uh, Dr. Ken Williams. Thank you, Dr. King. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be chosen to uh, present this year's Moran Address. I always remember Dean Moran telling me on my interview here in uh, April of 1985, he said, a C is defined as average work for a Francis Marion student. This is a policy I could live with, I thought to myself, <laughs> having earned many a C during my own student days. Uh, I'm, I'm titling today's address, Recurring Themes. I'll point out a few as we go along. Uh, I was born in the New York City borough of Queens. My uh, parents had grown up right around the corner from each other, and every other Sunday in my youth, we'd take the short drive from suburban Hicksville, Long Island, into Queens and visit both sets of my grandparents. My father's mother and her entire family had immigrated to New York from Sweden, they still spoke Swedish and retained strong accents. Uh, I regret that they never made any attempt to teach me the language, and in fact, uh, a struggle with foreign languages is one recurring theme that I have <laughs> encountered. About the only Swedish phrase I picked up was Octa poika, which apparently means get out of there, boy. <laughs> uh, I must have made some impression on them, however, because. Uh, I remember them always saying to my mother, Jean, oh, ye vis yeen, a oh, yeenius de boyus. So I must have made some impression on them there. Uh, on, the, uh, on the Sundays that we did not go into Queens, we invariably entertained my great uncle Frank Cameron from my mother's Scottish side of the family. Uh, uncle Frank was a great influence on me and uh, fostered my interest in science from an early age. He always brought me some kind of a gift, very often a sample of a chemical element. I'm not sure exactly where he got them, but he was the, uh, he was the vice principal of a high school, so I assume he lifted them from their lab, or at least got them somehow through that lab. Um, that collection of elements, by the way, would eventually exceed 40, obtained from him and other ways. Uh, one day out in the backyard, I remember my Uncle Frank taking a little wiffle plastic golf ball and straight face putter, knocked the ball clear over the top of the house out to the front yard. I was duly impressed and my attempts to duplicate the feat resulted in grounders at best and now I was hooked on golf as well, another recurring theme <laughs> in my life. Uh, that the collection of elements was housed in my basement laboratory. Uh, which contained the chemistry set I had gotten for my uh, eighth birthday from my grandparents and, uh, and any other chemicals and equipment that I could scrounge up. 
I remember going through substantial amounts of my mother's Clorox bleach, uh, which combined with the acid that we could make by burning sulfur would generate chlorine gas. One key, key word in that sentence is we. I had various friends on the block. We were children of the Sputnik space race age, and several of them had laboratories as well. Many an afternoon was spent in one house, basement, or the other trying to mix random chemicals, maybe make explosives or rocket fuels, etc. cetera. Um, the other part of that sentence worthy of note is burning sulfur and chlorine gas. I don't think you have to be a chemist to recognize these as smelly and hazardous. Uh, we would, for example, lead that chlorine gas over a pile of zinc scraps hacked out of an old battery, heated red hot in the flame of a propane torch, Great clouds of smoke would emanate off of that reaction. We had this old yellow plastic bucket that one of us would kind of stand downstream of the, of the action and try to collect as much of that cloud as possible. And we'd wash it all down with water. And when it evaporated, we'd scrape this ugly residue out of the bottom and put it in a bottle, label it zinc chloride. We figured what else could it possibly be. <laughs> <laughs> um, from endeavors such as these, my little suburban block of seven houses on each side of the street ultimately generated three PhD chemists. And in fact, that doesn't even include the kid that we all called the professor. I don't know if that ever happened to the professor. Uh, while crude, these experiments made high school chemistry pretty easy for me. And I remember my teacher, Mr. Ryan, I had to tell me, don't raise your hand all the time. I know you know the answer. Give the other students a chance. And if no one has it, I'll call on you. And I invariably did know the answer. Uh, I was smugly under the impression that I knew everything there was to know about the subject. Um, my father was willing to pony up the tuition to send me to college. He had seen enough of my endeavors in the workplace to know that my future lay more in my head than in my hands. And uh, besides, by getting me out of the house, he could finally get some fresh air to breathe. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I got the vague impression from a, a catalog, by the way, acting on vague impressions is another recurring theme, that Gettysburg College was a good chemistry school. Uh, a visit there with my parents was the first setting I had ever seen other than heavy suburbs. I was much taken with it. I remember we were interviewing with the chair of the department on uh, Saturday morning. He asked if I had taken the chemistry SAT. I said, yes, I had, but I hadn't got my scores. He picks up the phone, makes a call. A couple of minutes later, I see a little wink and a nod. Kind of says, pretty good. Perfect 800. Uh, he assumed he had a real prospect on his hands. <laughs> and, and, and with with great promise, I entered Gettysburg in the fall of 1969. Um, I was also a child of the uh, Civil War centennial. I loved anything old and historical. Where better to be than Gettysburg College? Uh, I en enthusiastically scoured their library, reading random snippets of any old books that struck my fancy. Uh, I was not then, and I'm still not what you might call a structured student. My learning ability has been likened to uh, the way a bull learns where the china is as it's <laughs> crashing around in, in the shop. Uh, one, day I, one day I went to that same chemistry professor with two old pre-1900 chemistry textbooks. I had found a paragraph in each of them that I thought contradicted the other. I asked if he'd clarify. He looks at one looks at the other, looks at me, says, don't we have an exam in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> Do we, I said. <laughs> Obviously, I was well studied up. Uh, the night before the final exam in that very same course, one of the other chem majors in the dorm came by, asked if I'd studied. Well, no, I said, I can't seem to find my notebook. Shocked, he looked at me, literally grabbed me by the collar, and shook me like shaking some sense, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. There wasn't much written in it anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, I call this recurring theme, things you can always shake your head at. <laughs> um, so when the, all was said and done that semester, the chemistry I thought I knew all about, I 
was lucky to get a gentleman C out of the course. Uh, add to that my German 101, the language thing. I went into the final exam there with what I thought was a low C. I get my grades, it's a D minus in the course. For the first time in my life, I went to check on a grade. I actually thought there might be an error. I go in, the prof says, oh, Williams, yes. Uh, you know, I have a two-year-old daughter at home, speaks neither English nor German. She would have done better on that test. Than <laughs> <laughs> All right, so D minus there. Even that was better than the F that I got in Calculus 1 that semester. Uh, one day I was up at the board solving problems and uh, encountered an integral with a D over DT in it. I pondered it for a second, picked up a piece of chalk and canceled out the two Ds. <laughs> uh, there, there was an audible gasp from the other fellow students and, and, and the professor just couldn't even find the words. But you <laughs> finally comes out with, do you know what the little D means? I said, no, that's why I'm trying to get it out of there. <laughs> if truth be known, the integral sign didn't mean a whole lot more to me than the little Ds did either. Uh, but I, I plowed ahead and in my sophomore year I found myself in organic chemistry with Dr. Calvin Schildnick. He was an old industrial polymer chemist, longer on practice than on academic theory. Uh, one day we, my roommate, also a chem major, and I went in to ask him a question. I go to his office. There's a back door from his office to his own personal lab back behind his office. Wow, this said, Setup had great appeal to me, sort of like my basement lab. We wandered in and I said, Dr. Shilnick, can, can we ask you a question? Without a yes or a no, he turns to me and he sticks an Erlenmeyer flask under my nose. He says, do you smell cyanide coming off of here? <laughs> uh, now, the technique one is taught as a gentle wafting until you can barely detect the odor. My technique had not reached that level of delicacy yet. I, stuck my nose in there, doing a big old snort off it, and confidently said, no, no cyanide. <laughs> Dr. Schillner goes, oh, good, good. <laughs> now, a couple aspects of this are telling. First of all, he's willing to dose a student with toxic gas <laughs> for a tidbit of chemical information. In fact, they make cyanide test strips, sort of like litmus paper, just for that purpose. Second of all, he's assuming that that student knows what cyanide gas smells like. <laughs> More properly, hydrogen cyanide. He had chosen the right student. I was willing to be dosed, and I did know what it smelled like. Uh, Schildnick penciled me in as his boy, and I would go on to work closely with him for the remainder of my time at Gettysburg. One day in lecture, he happened to mention that acetone reacts with bromine to produce a powerful lacrimator. In other words, a tear gas. This seemed pretty easy to me and my roommate, our other usual co-conspirator, with little winks and nods and maybe a mouth word or two across the lecture hall, we formulated a plan. I know where some bromine is. I'll get some acetone. I'll grab some glassware. Decided to cut physics class that day, we decided to put our plan into action. Our dorm, Apple Hall, had a communal kitchen area that would serve as our lab. Once there, we began. Uh, with the usual delicate lab technique, we pulled out this enormous Erlenmeyer flask and glug, 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 fill it up about halfway with acetone. That's a clear, colorless liquid, sort of often used as a nail polish remover. Then the bromine. The bromine is this red, fuming, noxious, dense liquid. The very word bromine comes from the Greek word for stench. So glug, 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 in goes the bromine. A little swirl, nothing. Just a red color, somewhat diluted down by the acetone. Oh, Shildnick doesn't know what he's talking about, I declared. All those fumes have made him senile. <laughs> Dismissiveness is another recurring theme. <laughs> As was my next suggestion, well, let's put some heat to it. <laughs> so we, we, uh, we, had an, we had an electric stove, and we turned it on impatiently cranked it probably all the way to the max, and we put the Erlenmeyer on the burner. I remember the three of us all sort of jostling straight over the head, trying to shove each other's head out of the way to look directly down into the Erlenmeyer flask, 
hopefully detecting the desired product. Um, no goggles, of course. Um, and all of a sudden, like somebody had turned a switch, the red color just gone. Just went colorless. Boom. Before we could even comment, this stuff erupted out of the flask in a huge cloud all over our faces. The highly lacrimatory nature of the product was immediately obvious. <laughs> uh, great clouds of gas emanating all over the place. In the fray, the bottle of bromine got knocked over in the sink. You could see heavy red vapors kind of waving around in the sink. Paint was already peeling off of the backsplash behind it. So obviously we couldn't wash ourselves up there. We'd go running down to the men's room to try to clean up, sort of fearful of permanent blindness, but also delighted at our successful reaction. Uh, the kitchen did have an exhaust fan, but it just blew it out into the hall. <laughs> uh, you, you could hear, you know, yelling and screaming working its way down the hall, uh, all kinds of fuss. I remember one guy yelling, it's a raid! <laughs> another, another resident could be seen trying to flush a large amount of vegetable matter down the toilet. Uh, and, uh, so we did our best to clean ourselves up a little bit. And, about then, about then, the resident advisor shows up. Coincidentally, he had just come from flunking a chemistry exam, which effectively ended his pre-med career. Uh, he was not amused at three nerdy young chem majors tear-gassing out the dorm. Uh, somehow, we suffered no permanent consequences from this incident, either uh, academically or physically, with one exception. That physics class that we cut was the introduction to Gauss's law. To this day, my understanding of electricity and magnetism is weak. <laughs> uh, another of my, famous, uh, my favorite stories from Gettysburg involves the smelliest substance in the world. Dr. Schilnick had ordered a pint of this organic sulfide compound from which I was going to make some polymers. One day, a package arrives in the mail with a letter attached to it. Letter explained that most chemists who ordered this stuff had no idea how truly foul it was. And when they found out, they didn't want it. So they, instead of the pint, they were sending us a complimentary gram. If we still wanted the pint, they'll send it on later for the usual charge. So the can it had a can with a key on the top that you peeled off, and then you had like a sardine can literally peel back the metal on there. And, Dr. Schildneck rummages around in the vermiculite in there, finds a little plastic bag, a little tiny brown bottle inside of it. He cuts it open, pulls out the little bottle, and checks the label, yeah, it's the right stuff. And unopened, sticks it back in the fume hood, back in his lab. As a poor tender of what was to come, I saw him make a little smell of his fingers and a grimace that I had never seen before. Uh, the next day, we have chemistry class scheduled. As we wander over to the building, there's some kind of fuss going on out on the lawn, like a, a bomb scare, perhaps. Uh, as we got closer, it was clear that the building smelled so bad that you couldn't get anywhere near it from this unopened bottle in a fume hood. Uh, to, to envision this odor, imagine a dog that has eaten too many dead skunks and then puked them up. Uh, Maybe uh, add garlic seasoned with tear gas. Uh, so finally, Dr. Schildnick strides purposefully into the building, and uh, as he later explained, he opened up the bottle and submerged it in a beaker of 30% hydrogen peroxide. The oxidation ultimately killed the odor, and by the next day, well, it still kind of smelled in there. We were back to business as usual. Uh, he never did order the pint. <laughs> Better or worse, I never made those polymers. Um, another of my, uh, let's say, malodorous substances recurring theme is a compound called caproic acid. The word caproic comes from the same root as Capricorn the goat, and this is a compound that makes goats smell the way they do. So one day at the came to the attention of my roommate and I that the chemistry department had purchased this newfangled glassware where the flask and the condenser and whatever just all popped together and a nice tight seal and everything was straight and neat and 
you know, Dr. Shilnick had hidden these away from us. He thought this made lab too easy. He was a proponent of, of boring holes in corks by, by hand and stuffing pieces of glass tubing through there to connect it to the next piece in the apparatus. And this invariably led to apparatuses that were crooked and leaky and occasional broken piece of glass tubing embedded in the palm of your hand and blood all over. And so uh, we decided we wanted to try the new glassware out. We had encountered a sample of a compound called ethyl caproate, the, an, an ester derived from that acid. Uh, esters are very fruity smelling. This particular one was an apple ester. It was delicious. It smelled like every apple in the world distilled into one bottle. And we said, great, let's grab the glassware. Let's go make some apple ester. So we go into the lab, we weigh the stuff out, we start boiling it up. Boy, this is easy, these just pop together, this is fun, we thought. Uh, what we had neglected to take into account is that this is what's called a reversible chemical reaction. As the goat acid and the ethanol form the apple ester, it began to react with the byproduct water, goes straight back to the goat acid again. No matter how long you cooked it, there was always goat acid in with your apple ester. Uh, we distilled it over, cleaned it up, the typical steps. By the time we got done, we smelled like a couple old goat, goat herders that were from a you know, month out in the fields. Uh, we had a Friday night party planned, which we went to, and uh, pretty quickly cleared the room of party people. In fact, uh, everywhere we went, we found ourselves strangely alone. Uh, and this is a very persistent odor as well. All attempts to wash it off with shampoo, with baking soda, and you name it, failed for at least two weeks. <laughs> uh, as my wife-to-be explained to us at the time, until that odor dissipates, you guys are decidedly persona au gratin. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've uh, read my, my biography, you'll see I got accepted to the University of Maryland as a, as a provisional graduate student with the understanding that I would maintain a 3.0 average and also pass the qualifying exam in organic chemistry, my chosen major field. I took that exam prior to the first semester, flunked it. I did have, you know, a lot of company in that respect. Took courses that first semester, even got a B in the organic class, take the test again. A little while later, I get called in to see the chair of the department. Turned out I had done even worse on it than I did the first time. I remember being led into this uh, dark, large, darkened room with the shades all pulled down. Five or six white-haired old men stationed randomly around the room. It looked like an experimental theater production of some sort. Uh, and finally the chair speaks up. Uh, well, Mr. Williams, <clears throat> uh, what do we expect, what do you expect us to do about your <clears throat> case? Until that moment, I was not aware I had a case. <laughs> <laughs> Soft, harumphing could be heard from all corners of the room. Uh, it dawned on me I was being asked to come up with some reason why I shouldn't be thrown out of school. I thought hard. I said, well, you know, I think one of the reasons is you have me as a teaching assistant in general chemistry, and I already know my general chemistry. I think if you had me in an organic lab, I'd learn my organic, get on track. There's a moment of silence. I'm under the opinion that silence in response to a point made in a debate is a sign of a point well made. And uh, I could see they were at least you know, pondering my suggestion. Finally, from the back corner, Dr. Wilkins Reeve speaks up. He says, oh, however, Mr. Williams, <coughs> we don't uh, normally allow anyone to teach the course who hasn't uh, <coughs> passed the test. <laughs> Uh, I responded with silence of my own. <laughs> uh, an awkward time later, Dr. Paul Mazzocchi, who would become my research director, spoke up and said, well, it is mid-year. We don't really have anyone lined up to take Mr. Williams' place. Maybe we should give him one more semester to make, make good. Uh, so uh, they even let me teach an organic lab. During that semester, I learned the organic chemist's most valuable skill, pushing arrows to denote bonds making and breaking as molecules interact with each other. I realized it was as if I had been trying to get a, a PhD in Chinese literature 
without having any idea how to read Chinese. Now I could. I was thus emboldened, I sort of plowed ahead at Maryland. Uh, there were still some bumps in the road, however. One semester, I was taking this required course in quantum mechanics. A professor called me up and said, I've calculated you need a 70 or better to get the B in the course. Now, this may say, sound pretty doable, but I had taken two exams already, and they didn't total anywhere near 70. <laughs> so, for the first time in my life, I, I sequestered myself with the book, and I sat down, and I taught myself the subject. Fear is my only true motivator. Um, final exam comes, 10 problems, 10 points apiece. I knew I had six of them, dead to rights correct made good starts on three of the others. I felt very confident I had made my 70. Get the grades a while later, C plus in the course, essentially an F plus as far as graduate school goes. For the second time in my life, I went in to inquire about a grade. I told them I thought I'd confident that I'd made that 70. He says, well, yes, you did. You made a 76. Unfortunately, the exam was too easy, and I couldn't give you the B. Uh, I have made sure that I never employed that grading policy in my teaching of my classes. Uh, so I was no longer working on a PhD at University of Maryland. I'd be lucky to escape with what they call a consolation master's. Uh, I found an opening for an instructor position at Stockton State College in the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey near Atlantic City, put together an application, and sent it in. Christmas break comes along. I go off for what I assume was a well-deserved vacation, leaving no forwarding address as usual. After the holidays, I return back to Maryland. Even then, I can't quite face going straight back to the lab. So I went over to the library as kind of a debriefing period. Uh, who walks in but Dr. Mazzocchi? Ah, oh, Williams, there you are. Those people from Stockton have been trying to call you for two weeks. So I ran upstairs and gave him a call. I said, yeah, yeah, we'd like to have you for an interview. When can you come? Oh, any time, I said. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Once again, one can always shake one's head. <laughs> but the interview went well. Uh, and in fact, one of the professors there was a graduate of Gettysburg College and decided to give our old chair a call for a recommendation. Ah, Williams, yes, he said. Uh, he was never one of our flashier students, although he was enthusiastic enough. I remember he spent a lot of time in the pub. <laughs> well, I got the job, so I lived up to my recommendation. In fact, beer is another re recurring theme in my life. <laughs> my old man always said, yes, beer is an acquired taste. It, it took Kenny half a glass. <laughs> uh, but it also turned out I was a pretty good teacher. I think. My struggles with grades allowed me to relate pretty well to my, my students. Um, one semester at, uh, at Stockton, there, our, our physical chemistry professor was going on sabbatical. A meeting was held to see who would teach the course in his absence. And the dean looks around and says, well, does anyone here have substantial graduate work in physical chemistry? I said, yeah, I got 30 credit hours in PCHEM. Everybody looks at me expectantly and says, Unfortunately, it's all in the same two courses. <laughs> <laughs> they were not nearly as amused as I thought. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, I, um, near, the, uh, near the end of my time at, at Stockton, I actually sat in on my math class and sat in on a uh, PCHEM class, finally learned the, the basics that I should have learned many years ago. Um, and I finally felt ready for graduate school. So I ended up at Virginia Tech, finally started getting some decent grades. I still enjoyed working in the lab and, uh, and still employed my bull in the china shop techniques. Uh, I worked a lot with a uh, compound called triethylamine, which smells a lot like dead fish. Um, one day I noticed on the label it says flashpoint 14 degrees Fahrenheit. I find that 
hard to believe that the, you, you can ignite this sub stuff on a cold winter's day. I opened the top, poured a couple fingers in a big old beaker, rummaged around, found one of these Bunsen burner strike lighters and stuck it down there. Whoosh, whoosh. Nothing, as I smugly expected. There's that dismissive attitude again. And again, well, let's put some heat to it. So <laughs> put a top on it, stuck it in the, uh, stuck it in the uh, hot water bath, and uh, let it kick up some vapors. You know? Took the top off, start striking it again. Finally, on about the fifth strike, whoosh, this stuff goes up in a great blue flame, burnt the hair completely off my arm. Uh, at that exact moment, my research director walks into the room directly into this plume of burning hair and dead fish. And he says, what in the world are you doing over there, Williams? And I said, I'm checking the flash point of triethylamine. He says, you're an animal. <laughs> uh, one, day, uh, one day, I'm working in the lab, he says, well, you seem to enjoy research, Ken. And I said, yeah, I do. Is that unusual? He says, no, no, but I hear you enjoy golf also. I said, oh, yeah, I do. I love golf. He says, are you any good? I said, man, not bad. I'd break 80 if I play well. He says, are you going to go pro? And I said, no, there's nowhere near good enough to go pro. And then he comes in for the kill. He says, well, then I'll get back in the lab on Friday. <laughs> So anyway, all went well at uh, Virginia Tech, and I finally uh, got my, my Ph.D. in 1985, and was lucky enough to find an opening here at, at Francis, then Francis Marion College, and, uh, and was fortunate enough to get the position. I have thoroughly enjoyed my time here at Francis Marion, have forged many close relationships with colleagues and friends. Uh, I remember one morning about... Uh, well, Saturday morning, my wife and I still asleep. The phone rings. It's campus security. They have found a couple of students trying to get into the lab, so they wanted to check on some lab results that uh, they had obtained overnight. I said, I knew exactly who, he was who they were talking about. I said, yeah, let them in. I'll be right there. Both of those students now have their PhDs in <coughs> chemistry. So uh, anyway, one of the uh, aspects of my time at uh, Francis Marion that I've thoroughly enjoyed is uh, my unofficial call at the end of the semester, uh, which, uh, <laughs> which uh, certainly does not mean there's no work left to do, well to the contrary, but uh, it's a state of mind. Um, each semester I try to come up with something new and amusing, riddles and songs and jokes and you name it, and this has occupied an increasing amount of my brain power over the years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as with many of us old timers, my, my uh, knowledge of our current te technology is a, a little bit weak, and it, in fact, most of what I have learned about the use of my computer has come from solving the problems I presented to myself as I attempt to bring my latest idea to fruition. Uh, so I thought it might be kind of fun to take a, a look at a few old ones with a uh, kind of a how, uh, you know, this behind the scenes story, now you know the rest of the story kind of thing. How did I get them looking the way they did? Uh, so I'll start with one that I called Extra Extra. Okay. Uh, the fall of 2011 semester at Francis Marion University in Florence, South Car Carolina was declared effectively over today by Professor of Chemistry, Dr. Ken Williams. It was one of his earliest calls on record and left the faculty stunned but relieved. <laughs> <laughs> Responses from colleagues included, it's not too early for me, I've been waiting for this and simply thank God. <laughs> there comes a time in every semester, Williams elaborated, when further academic input by faculty becomes counterproductive to student learning. Enough projects have been presented, enough material, etc., to occupy the brain power. And this was a website I found that allowed me to name my own paper, the PD Times, and gave me two columns to work with. The rest over there does is just boilerplate kind of stuff. 
and it took me some trial and error to fit what I wanted into the two columns. And, and besides, I love inventing imaginary quotes from imaginary people. <laughs> um, I've had some fun with some of my recent ones. Here's one, uh, the email went out, uh, said, I just got the attached message, uh, thought I'd send it on. Make of it what you will. <laughs> so sorry to see your semester dragging on and on just because of an academic calendar rammed through by the previous administration. <laughs> Very sad. When it's over, it's over. Hashtag semfefe. <laughs> the, the, uh, the technology here was decidedly uh, low tech. In fact, I just found a Trump tweet online and uh, did my best by trial and error to, to match the font size and color, wrote what I wanted to write, cut it out with scissors, scotch taped it into place, <laughs> and, and then scanned it to myself and sent it on. Uh, one one uh, nice touch here, I thought, was if you look way down at the, at the bottom, if I can work this thing, if you work, look way down here at the bottom, the time and date were perfectly accurate. I had those written in in advance and just waited till that exact minute on that exact day to hit the send button. Uh, the extra O in so sorry was my wife's idea. It's kind of a, a nice touch. Let's get myself straight which one's coming next. Um, the uh, craft beer industry has made great strides in recent years. And uh, FMU professors, Travis Knowles, Brian Fisher, Ali Stedman's husband, Sean, Susan Peters' husband, Dave, are key figures in, uh, in seminar brewing. If you have not yet gone, go to seminar brewing. There's a plug for you guys. Uh, so I decided to uh, piggyback on their success with, with this effort. Uh, I found a... Uh, website online that uh, allowed you to uh, design your own label, essentially. So this is uh, It's Over Semester IPA, uh, brewed at FMU by Ken Williams. A uh, little thing in the middle, there's uh, like the 110% alcohol by volume. Um, uh, this was actually designed for as uh, advertising. If you kind of look at the top shoulders of the bottles, there was actually advertising labels written over those, and I had to chop those out and make them look as much like the bottle as possible. I envisioned possibly another scotch tape and the scissors job, but this one I actually uh, used the paint program, and I found little areas of the kind of the wood grain that I could fake for the wood grain, and little areas of the bottle that I could put paint, uh, over the bottle. Took me many, many attempts to get it looking as well as it does. In fact, stubbornness is another recurring theme. Um, for my most recent, F oh, by the way, a seminar is our sort of code name for a, an every Wednesday night get together, and I am proud to have assembled the very first one back in the fall of 1999. We have not missed a Wednesday since. There has been a quorum present every Wednesday, even Christmas Day. That's it. Yeah. In fact, uh, you can get reprimanded for missing too many seminars in a row, I can remember. Um, so for my latest effort, I realized I've been declaring it over all this time, so I decided to go to the ultimate declaration, the de <laughs> declaration of independence. Uh, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for a faculty to dissolve the academic bonds with their students, etc. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I took the actual wording from the uh, Declaration of Independence, copied it, found an old font that made it look sort of real, uh, found an old parchment uh, paper online and printed that out and printed the whole thing on the parchment. If you look carefully around the edges, you, you'll see that I uh, faked a couple of these, uh, these Signatures is Pum Rooks down there and Blackwell there and, and Jay Krebs over there and Geo Harding up there mixed all in with Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, etc. Uh, some are less elaborate. Here's one called Important Message from the Chair. <laughs> 
that a piece, the only piece of cardboard I could find was the uh, top of the box containing my PhD dissertation. <laughs> if, they, if, if you open that, that, that's what it says on the inside of the box. Uh, in, in, the, in the background, you can't quite see it very, very well, but uh, there's a, a beer mug right here that's a, actually yellow paper inside an empty beer mug to make it look kind of like a beer. Uh, here's an old trophy that we used to play the chemistry physics challenge for. And just to hear you can't really see it, but I'm going to mention it anyway. It's a, one of my favorite photos of me picking a, my golf ball out of the hole after a hole in one on our annual fall golf trip. Uh, here's one called Now Showing. Uh, this one actually caused a bit of a kerfuffle as uh, one of my colleagues in the department uh, uh, replied, in fact, replied all to the entire crew, this gets sent out to approximately 100 people or so, uh, about all of the work that still remained and, and et cetera, et cetera, and caused, as I said, a bit, a bit of a kerfuffle. Uh, note that a free ticket is included. <laughs> Uh, some of them have been perhaps a little subtle. Here's one. You're invited. Kenneth, Dr. Kenneth B. Williams invites you to join him in a wonderful place where the semester is over. <laughs> Reservations accepted. I got many replies. How do I get in on this? <laughs> like Zen Buddhism, only realization is required to reach enlightenment. <laughs> Accept the invitation, grasshopper. <laughs> uh, one of my favorites, uh, and where I learned how to use PowerPoint, is a, a thing called New Neurotransmitter Discovered. And there we go, there's an FMU professor. There's the professor's brain. There are the neurons. We're going in now into the brain. There's the synapse of the neurons that <coughs> transmit the signal from one to the other. There's a close-up of the uh, receptors down on the bottom and the neurotransmitter molecules crossing the synapse. And there's a blow-up <laughs> of it. Uh, this was, a, again, kind of old, old school. I actually cut out little circles. They're actually reddish and bluish, but you can't quite see the colors. And I wrote it over on each of the transmitter molecules. In fact, that looks like my wife's handwriting. Anytime we need anything neat, she is the one, is the one that picks up the pen. Um, I kind of like the one down on the bottom right, just docking in as it gets there. Uh, and then there's the effect of that uh, transmitter <laughs> interaction. That slide was actually a, sort of a, an afterthought. Um, so, like a rock band that uh, tries to follow up their big hit with something similar, but it's never quite as good. Uh, I decided to go to the PowerPoint well one more time, and, and I came up with this effort, um, which is admittedly somewhat bio, uh, autobiographical. The lecture is crystal clear. <laughs> Sam's probing. <laughs> is earth, earth, uh, research earth-shattering. I've never been able to get results quite that good. Uh, yet he's sympathetic to others. That's me at my computer, as a matter of fact, on a regular basis. So if he says it's over, it's over. <laughs> I, I've always found the most interesting man in the world uh, uh, amusing. And you can see clearly this was a fall semester, so I put a stay merry of my friends in there. Well, I always felt that this one was a little forced, not as good as the neurotransmitter one. Uh, so I'd like to take a mulligan. I'd like to redo the ending of this one. So we're going to wrap up today with my uh, admittedly autobiographical uh, remake. And this will give you an idea what I intend to do in my, with myself in my retirement. So I hope my lectures remain crystal clear and my exams as probing as ever. And I still intend to tinker in the lab, so that still might happen. Uh, and there, uh, again, I feel your pain. So this time, if I say it's over, it's over. <laughs> right? And uh, that is as close as I can get.
for riding off into the sunset. Thank you, folks. I have enjoyed reminiscing for you. Thank you very much, Ken. Well, everybody here is invited over to the cottage for a reception uh, straight away. But there's one question that I do have to... Ah, there's a presentation that we have to make. Excuse me. Ken, back up here, please. <laughs> but before I give you this, uh, on your way out, I've been asked by the chemistry department, there are cards up on the table if you would fill in a, a story that you have about Ken they would like to receive those uh, stories and to present to him later but Ken kind of like student I, evaluations a, <laughs> a, a little like that I have a presentation for you here right um, it says the 11th annual Will, William C Moran address Dr Ken Williams March 28 2019 very nice. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice. And uh, that completes the, the afternoon. Uh, love to see you all over in the cottage for the reception. Thank you.